Um, so what is 5S? So it's really a tool that was developed in industry to help um, improve efficiency and, uh, and discipline within the workplace in order to help improve processes and whatnot. Um, and basically it's an enabler of lean production and waste-free production. So, so what you might, a good way to think about this is that a lean organization is clean and orderly, but a clean and orderly organization might not be lean. So how does this affect the workplace? So really it's designed to, to as an approach to develop an organized workplace, and it sort of encourages a culture of responsibility. So everyone has to buy into the system and contribute to its improvement, and it's a continuous improvement type uh, process, so it's constantly being updated with new, with new features. And some of the benefits of this process are, hopefully you can improve the safety of the work environment, um, employee involvement with, the whole, with all the processes, cleanliness, which also leads back to the safety and efficiency. And ultimately, in the lab setting, I think what we're mostly interested in is getting more consistent results from our experiments. Um, we, we're in an environment where we're constantly changing our employees with grad students leaving and coming in. So the system, we think, helps um, the onboarding of those new employees, um, help them act get acclimated to the environment and everything that's going on in the lab. And additionally, it helps with getting supplies on time and not when they run out. And ultimately, we hope it leads to additional funding, which we're all hopefully interested in. So what are the five S's? So I mentioned this was developed in industry, and it was actually developed in Japan. So the five S's were originally all Japanese words. But conveniently, whoever translated this into English found five words that corresponded to the same meanings and also started with S's. So the S's are sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. And I'll go through all of these in detail, um, starting with sorting. So the idea here is that before you do any cleaning, you want to document what, what your work area looks like to start with. Um, and this would be like the before condition. And you can see pictures here. Hopefully your lab doesn't look like this, but I know some do. Um, but you can see it's a mess and it's hard to find things and it's hard to get anything done really. Um, so, so then you do an initial cleaning of the area where you remove any unnecessary items and, and keep the things that you need, obviously. So to do this, what, what we've done is, so you set up a, basically a red tag area. So this is an area where you put things that you don't need, but you're not sure if someone else in the lab might need. And, and, then, and then at the end of this organization, the entire team can go through that, that uh, catalog of items and decide if, if anything can really be disposed of. So at the end of this process, hopefully you have just the items that you need to get your job done. So once that's done, the idea is that you want to set these things in some order so that you can efficiently do your job. And here what you want to do is identify the tools that you need, the equipment, supplies, etc., cetera, um, and put these in positions where they're easily accessible and in some kind of order so that you don't have to run back and forth in the lab. Um, and basically the way you do this is first you want to define the major processes that you work on in the lab. And for each of those, you can draw sort of a process map. So showing the locations of where jobs are done, what's used, and so on. Um, and then from that map, you can actually figure out where the sources of waste are and how those might be corrected. Um, and, and that also allows you to rearrange things to, to more efficiently do the job. And the way you want to organize items is based on the frequency that they're used. So if you're using something every day, like a set of pipettes, you probably want those right at the bench right next to you so you can easily get back gain access to them. For things that are less, less frequently used, maybe use uh, some kind of buffer once a week or so. 
Um, that can be stored in some per some location that's slightly further away. And then if you, there's something that you use even less frequently, you can keep those in some cabinet in the, in the storage. So this is sort of what one of these process maps looks like um, initially. So you can see this is a mess. The user has to run back and forth between different pieces of equipment and go back to the bench. Um, and you can see there's lots of potential here for for spills if you're carrying things, accidents to, if you trip over things if the, if the area isn't very neat. Um, you could run into other people um, if there's multiple people doing this job. So there's lots of inefficiencies with this out, this out, this, uh, this outline. Um, and what the goal is to actually get it to look something like this where you can do things in sequence and slowly move along the bench so you're not constantly running back and forth. So, so that's the processes. What about the supplies? Um, for this, what we, one of the things that you can do is actually set up a, an inventory where you keep, keep your supplies in nicely, nicely um, organized bins or cap in shelves. And each of these bins should have some kind of label on them telling you what that product is um, and how, where the, the minimum and maximum levels that you should have of that item so you know when to place orders and, and how, how frequently it's being used. So a couple of different ways you could do this. So you could use the two bin system, which is actually what we use in our lab. Um, so the idea here is that you have two bins for each uh, supply. And when one bin is empty, that's when you place orders for, for that item. And another option is to use sort of a min-max levels where in a cabinet you have uh, rows of items. And it's, I'm not sure if you can see this red line here, but that would mark when, when that supply has reached the point where it needs to be ordered again. So here's some examples of before and after doing the set and order um, step. Uh, so up here you can see all these water baths and dry baths are kind of all over the place and you probably have to go back and forth here. But what they've done is actually set these up in a line so the worker can just go down the line basically and complete the um, whatever process they're working on. And then here again is another bench where everything is pretty disorganized before but they've set it in order so that everything is within reach of the user and they still have a nice, and they have an open working space where they can actually do their job. So once things are set in order, um, something that's also pretty important is actually keeping it clean. So you don't want a bench that looks like this. This is probably from industry, but you can see that there's a lot of potential for contaminations in a situation like this, or, and it's also pretty difficult to find something on this shelf, shelf if you need to, um, some item from there. So it's important to keep the area clean. Um, and the other thing you want to do during this process is to actually go through all of your equipment and check for leaks and other problems um, so that you can prevent con contamination. And you want to do this at the beginning, but you also want to check it on a regular basis, preferably on a daily basis, and fi fix any potential problems before they become major issues. And the fourth Fourth S is standardized. Um, and so in this case, the idea is that you develop these standard operating proce procedures um, and protocols so that you can easily tell new employees how to do things, like ordering, placing orders and whatnot. Um, so that you, every time someone comes in, you don't have to, you're not constantly giving the same spiel over and over again. And another aspect of that is to develop some sort of audit schedule where someone can actually go through and check check compliance of the 5S system. And, and the ta the individual tasks should be assigned to different people. Um, and finally, there's you want to establish some common methodology so that your implementation of 5S can be um, cons consistent throughout your organization. So one of the most uh, obvious uh, forms of standardization that you'll see when we go on a tour of our lab is this taping standards. So, so what we, we end up taping around a lot of the objects in our lab and the different tape colors mean different things. 
So for example, uh, permanent location for equipment is, is outlined in blue. Um, if you have temporary storage of different items like work in progress, uh, finish, finished items, uh, carts, and so on, it would be marked in orange, um, and so on down the line. And here's an example of how we've taped our lab. So this is our microscope room where we do a lot of our imaging. And you can see the blue tape around the, the optical table so, if, so that we know exactly where that should be. Um, and then around di the different items on the microscope table, around the scope itself, the stage inserts, and the joystick and whatnot. So another thing we've done is sort of standardized our lab benches. So we were in a situation where, where each bench was assigned to one individual. But we realized that that's not very scalable. If we get in, so our lab has eight benches. If we have more than eight people, how do we assign the lab space to each person? So what we ended up doing was actually saying that the labs shouldn't belong to individuals, but they're communal. And so each bench is actually has a standard layout so that people can come in and use basically whatever bench they want. And then we have a separate storage area for all the chemicals and personal solutions and stuff. Um, so this is sort of what we've, how we've outlined the basic bench. We have a space for our pipettes, uh, sharps containers, and the tips, and so on. So there's also situations where you probably don't want to tape. So if you have a biological cabinet, um, you don't want to tape in there because of possible contaminations or so, so on. So one thing you can do there is actually just take a picture of what you want it to look like and post that near your workstation. And then it's pretty easy to check, to compare the, the actual state of the, that location with, with the picture. So, so far I've talked about the first four S's and I've kind of gone through those fairly quickly. Um, and they're, I think they're pretty straightforward and intuitive. Uh, the last part, the sustaining part, is actually what we found to be the most challenging. Um, so we originally, did all of the organization and everything in our in our lab up in phase two. And like six months later, we had to move. So we moved into the lab in phase one. <laughs> and so it was, we were a little discouraged that we'd have to do all this process over again. But in fact, we had done all the organization, so really we had gotten rid of all of our junk. And so we didn't have to move that to our new lab, which was, which was nice. Um, but at the time, we hadn't really thought too much about how we were going to maintain this organization. And so after our move, we started looking more seriously into it. And I came across this book called 5S for Service Organizations and Offices. So, so that I couldn't really find any information on how to implement this in the lab. And this was actually the closest thing I found. And this is actually available in the BT library if you're interested. Um, and basically what, what this taught me was that you need to establish some enablers, some, some structures, processes, and practices that allow you to actually maintain 5S. And so I'll go through all these different um, types of enablers. So the first is structures. So these are groups of people that, that sort of oversee and, and describe the 5S process. So the 5S council, is, in, is uh, responsible for creating the implementation roadmap, how you're gonna actually implement 5S in the lab, um, creating these measures of performance, which are actually really important, and we didn't actually see the, the importance of these until fairly recently, and, and we've started to really think more about what we, should, what we need to do to, to measure the performance of 5S to, to sort of quantify how it's, how it's actually improving our lab work. Um, the 5S Council is also responsible for reviewing any, all the progress on 5S, and they also approve any policy changes um, to the system and, and so on. And the 5S office, which is sort of a subset of that council, actually does all the reporting of the progress. They prepare the training material and also uh, create any policies practices or 5S. And those processes uh, involve developing a 5S charter, which sort of gives you a roadmap of, of where 5S is going to go and what you expect it to, 
how do you enter, what you what the expected risks might be. Um, and also it actually outlines the, the measures of performance that you're going to use to to uh, evaluate 5S, 5S and benefits and uh, downfalls for your lab. Um, so, and then you also want to figure out exactly what what measures of those, sorry, what quantities of those measures of performance are actually going to indicate success or failure for you. So, so once you have this established, most likely it's it's sort of a dynamic process, right? So you want you want people in the lab to have some way of actually changing the system, but you don't want people just randomly changing things because it can quickly lead to chaos and you're back to where you started. So to do that, there's a couple of uh, ways to do that. So there's a blue tags, this idea of blue tags. So these are actually labels that you stick on items and you fill this out and say what it is, what the item is, where it should be moved and why. And then there's a, an accompanying register that we, we just keep on our uh, wiki page um, where, where you also input all of the information that's on that um, blue tag. And so this gives you sort of a central location where someone can actually check to see what, what's been requested and so on. Um, and sort of a complement to that, but more for processes, is what's called an implementation sheet. So here you want to see state the problem, what you recommend as a solution, um, and what, that, what the impact of that solution might be. And, and then this goes through the, the 5S Council and people decide what, you know, what, what is implemented and what is not. And actually in our lab, we found that this, this is a lot more general than the blue tags and actually we've mostly used this. I don't think we've had a single blue tag yet in our lab, but we have, we have several implementation sheets already. So another Another process that's sort of important is creating some kind of reward system to a recognition system to to encourage people to actually participate in 5S. So that book I mentioned um, recommends having some non-monetary um, reward. So this might be just a picture up on the, the in the lab or some small token like a key ring or a mug or something like that. And some of the possible awards could be for the best uh, area as far as time is, is concerned, or possibly the most changes that have been suggested. So the third area of enablers is the infrastructure. So this includes a workplace visual board where you can actually show um, different things, it's like a before and after photos of, of your implementation of 5S. Uh, who's responsible for all the different areas in the lab, uh, what, your, what the specific measures of performance are, and how they've evolved over time. Um, possibly a photo of the, the award winners, um, as well as the audit results, which I'll talk a little bit more about a little later. So, so I've talked a little bit about most of these. I'll talk more about measures of performance at the end. Um, but what I want to show you quickly is our ownership matrix. So our lab actually has four different rooms, and we've sort of divided these among four different, three different people. Uh, so I'm responsible for the small microscope room and this other room, and then we have other people that are responsible for the other areas. So what does it mean to be responsible for those? Well, basically they go through each day and check, go through a checklist, which I'll show in a second. Um, and make sure and check the compliance with 5S if there's some cleaning that needs to be done they're responsible for that as well and if they're out one day then we also have a backup person for that area um, so the other the other infrastructure item that I think is really important is to have some kind of inventory management so I touched on this a little bit before but the way we keep track of our inventory is by using bins, which I'll you'll just see in the tour. Um, and each bin has a, a label on it, which is called a Kanban card from the Japanese uh, version of 5S. And on this card, you have the item name, 
of the ID number in our limb system and how when we should place orders and how much how much of that we should order what we do. And this is tied in with a master index of supplies. So we use a limb system that's called Lab Collector. And this, this allows us to actually have a, a, com a pretty comprehensive list of the supplies and chemicals in our lab. And we can have, and in Lab Collector, we can know where exactly that item is. And then, so we could say that uh, one item is in a certain cabinet, and then you can go to that cabinet. And on the cabinet, it'll have a list of exactly where in the cabinet that item is. Um, and this, and then also, we need to calculate the reorder levels, as I mentioned before. So just quickly, I, I just wanted to show Lab Collector real quickly. I'm sure a lot of you have your own wind systems, but we found this one pretty, pretty useful. Um, so this is an example of um, the chemical inventory. So if we wanted to find agarose, we just search for agarose, and it brings up the description. And you can see the location over here is in 320 cabinet one. And it also has all the order information that we need. And if, if someone needed to order this, they could just click on this add to order list, and it puts it all into a centralized location where the whoever's responsible for purchasing can just go to that list and place all the orders maybe once a week. So Lab Collector has a, a bunch of different categories. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here, but if you're interested in any more, there's the URL right there. I think the license is maybe $1,000 per year, but it's, it's definitely worth it. Okay, so that brings me to the practices, which uh, include a daily checklist, which the people who are responsible for each area have to go through. There's also a weekly audit, which is done by someone else besides the person who's responsible for that area. There's these things called ground zero walks. And finally, I'll finish by talking a little bit more about measures of performance. So the daily checklist is just a list of item, a list of items where the the reviewer will go through the area and check each one. So it'll look to see if there's any unnecessary items that have been left out, and if there are, are no discrepancies, the the score would be a five. And for every problem they notice, they would mark one off of that. So you can the scores for each item range from zero to five. And the total score will range from 0 to 50. So that's what is done on a daily basis. Um, for che actually checking compliance, there's this notion of a weekly audit. So in this case, we found it most useful for people who aren't usually in the lab to actually go through and, and go through that same checklist. And the reason we'd like the non-lab people to do this is as you're working in the lab, it's pretty easy to overlook something that that you see every day. And so if someone isn't in there quite as often, they, they'll probably notice that thing is sticking out a lot more than someone who sees it every day. So I think it's, it's quite useful to have someone without lab experience to actually go through and do these weekly audits. And then there's something called the ground zero walk. And this is a little more informal, where the PI of the lab should actually walk through and talk to people and sort of just get an idea of how people feel about 5S and how, how it's actually worked in the lab. So after the audits, I guess you can't really see these too well. So this is just the score sheet again. So the auditors would go through and fill this out. And then we sort of compile the results of, of each one. So we have this radar plot that's, that makes it pretty easy to see what, what areas are lacking for each area. And then we can track the total, total uh, total score over time. And you can see here we start off fairly poorly, but we've slowly improved over time, which is, which is good to see. Um, so a little bit more about the ground zero walks. So as I said, this should be done by the PI, um, maybe on a weekly, daily basis, depending on its availability. Um, and here they should look for potential problems, um, not just what's, what's out in plain sight, but they should also look in drawers and corners and cabinets and et cetera, um, and talk to employees. But it's really not as an inspector. You don't want them to be going through with a white glove, um, checking things. It's really just to sort of coach people along to encourage their participation in 5S. 
So I just want to close by talking a little bit more about these measures of performance. So, so it's important that you keep them simple and you don't have too many. So the, the book I uh, mentioned recommends no more than three or four of these. And a couple of possible examples are, so you could measure the, the amount of space that you've actually freed up from by using 5S. Uh, or some recurring things, you could check how your productivity in the lab has improved, uh, the number of suggestions you've received, and the numbers, you, excuse me, the numbers that you've actually implemented. So, so just to give you an idea of what our lab has found to be useful uh, measures of performance. So our lab does a lot of microscopy, a lot of imaging. So we decided one, one thing that we should keep track of is actually how many images are being uploaded to, oh, uh, sorry, uploaded to this uh, database that we have called Omero, which is a microscopy uh, imaging database. And you can see the results here. So we had this big spike where we actually started to, to actually implement Omero, um, where I was uploading a bunch of images at a time. The other thing we decided was our lab output. So we do a lot of gene, synthes gene synthesis and sample preparation. So another um, measure of performance we decided to use was the number of things that we actually put in our own system, lab collector. And actually looking at this, you can see, so our initial um, guess was, or sorry, our initial input to the data was pretty high, and then it sort of tailed off. And it sort of got us thinking about how, what's going on here. And we decided that we really didn't have a good uh, this description of what should go in each of those different categories of lab collector. So some people were putting sequences as, as samples or um, and some were putting them just as sequences, which aren't, aren't included in this report. So, we, so it led us to actually improve our description of how, how we should use these tools. And finally, which um, a lot of people are interested in, is how, how our number, number of publications has increased over time. And probably something you have a little less control over, but it's also kind of interesting to keep track of the citations that we use, or the citations that cite your paper. So those are the measures of performance that we've decided to use. Um, we sort of implemented these kind of late in the game. Um, so we don't really have a good um, idea of how, how the implementation of 5S has improved these or decreased them. But we hope to keep track of how these are changing as we keep sort of evolve our 5S system. So that's, that's basically how our implementation of 5S. So I just want to summarize what I've talked about a little bit. I hope you all agree. I, I guess you're here because probably you do agree that there's a lot of room for improvement in the efficiency of how our academic labs are run. And I think 5S is a great tool to help, or, help us organize our laboratory and improve, and improve the efficiency in how we run things. Um, as I said, sustaining 5S is actually the most challenging, challenging aspect. And I recommend highly that you, that if you do decide to do 5S, that you actually define your measures of performance fairly early on so you can get a good idea of how, how 5S is affecting, affecting those. And it really requires a buy-in from everyone. We've been pretty lucky in our lab that, that everyone is pretty, has been pretty good about contributing to the whole effort and, and uh, really, really helping us get this off and running. So I'll just finish by thanking some people. So, so this this work actually came about um, a couple years ago after uh, Jean visited Life Technologies and came back completely obsessed with 5S because he saw how how their production labs were using it to to keep contaminations down and keep the products fairly consistent over time. So we've that's how we got started, <coughs> and then the the other ideas came from this, this book for 5S um, in the office. And finally, I just want to thank the, the other members of the Synthetic Biology Group, uh, especially John, uh, Mandy, and Jody, Neil, Chris, Laura, and Greg. So, so Mandy, Jody, Laura, and Chris, and Greg have been doing our, our weekly audits. 
and Chris and Neil have been really helpful in or actually organizing the different spaces in the lab. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. So let me repeat the question for everyone. So she asked if we've actually implemented the 5S Council and if it extended beyond our group. So we have actually implemented it, and but it does just include people in our in our research group so far. The other question I had is that it looks like you need to have a lot of space in order to implement this. Do you have any comments on labs that might have space challenges that maybe don't have room to store? Um, um, not using? Is that so actually, I would say that if you have less space, it's more of an advantage to implement this because it helps you actually keep things organized and make better use of the space that you do have. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a good tool for even small space. So those extra things that you don't use, like maybe your um, in your lab your research focus might change within six months or a year, so you have equipment mm -hmm. that you're not going to use. Do you guys have a space here where you store that? Um, I guess, no, the answer, the easy answer is no, um, but I'm sure if you work with facilities, maybe, maybe they would help you with that. I think partly it's the nature of the type of work that you do, yeah. um, you know, if you're, you know, heavy on the equipment piece, and it is, uh, where you have multiple pieces of equipment that, you know, it's pulled in front and used, and maybe it's not. Supervisors buying in. Uh, I think I think it would be pretty difficult um, because if they don't buy into it, how how are you going to convince someone, some grad student, to, to actually do it as well? Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty important that, that from the top down, everyone is involved in the entire process. It, it seems like it would take a significant amount of effort for the startup. Yes, it does. Um, so, and that's why after two years, we're still sort of in the process of getting things up and running. Um, the actual taping um, was pretty time consuming as well. Um, I think it took us like four or five of us, like a week, although we didn't work on it straight through the whole entire week. It took us roughly a week to, to tape up all four, four rooms. Um, and then obviously getting all the protocols together Stuff like that does does definitely take some time, but I think it's I think it's worth it, worth the effort. And I have a question: um, Can parts of this um, be adapted to the laboratory without having embracing the entire system? And I ask that because I, I see some of some other people are taping in the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think different aspects can be useful on their own. Um, the taping is nice because it. It gives you a visual cue of when things are out of place and um, what should go where. Um, but I think I think to be really effective, it's it's best to use the entire system. Um, we ourselves are probably not using the entire system as well. So, like I said, we don't really use the blue tags um, and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's it's up to the, to the lab that's organizing it to 